So you remember Harry Frankfurt? I mean, this was this, we read, um, we had a dialectic, per se, on him before, his um, essay on bullshit. So this is a little bit different, right? Uh, here he's going to be talking about, well, well, we'll see about compatibilism. Does anybody here believe in fate? You do? What is faithful in your book? Don't, you know, you're doing anything. Faithful? Faithful. What would you, what would be faithful? Well, I just think that, like, Yeah, I sometimes I want to like, put this like, everything's like pre-decided. Like if something happens, I think it happens for a reason. Like I find a reason to get everything that's happened. I don't know if that's the thing. Those are two different things. To say everything happens for a reason, to find a reason everything that happens. But that's okay. Yeah. I like the fact that you said that. Carlos, you made your hand up. No, you did. Anybody else believe in fate? When I saw my wife for the first time, I knew that moment I'd marry her. Think about that. Besides, it sound like a Nicholas Sparks line. We think we were meant to be. I don't know. Um, you know, this idea of free agency or free will, however you want to say it, uh, this is at the bottom of a lot of things in our lives. And it, it could be the very difference between us and any machine. It could certainly be the difference between us and some animals, right? So, when we see like an animal doing something it shouldn't do, right? So if an animal makes a mess inside, we might say bad dog, but we don't mean bad dog. The dog's just doing what a dog would do. Same thing with young children, you know, we don't have a problem before they're potty trained, right? But at some age, it's like, hey, you should have known better. And if your parents tell you that, isn't that sort of free will, you should have known better? Is that suggesting that you could have done something else? Or, I mean, all of you chose Villanova. Do you think it was set in the stars for you? No? Could have went somewhere else? No, if you really think you could have, then you know, that's free will. If you think you're here and there's not much you can do about it. What about like biology? I mean, does, you know, biology and physics. Does physics follow predetermined laws? Or, you know, the planet circles. You know, well, let's put it this way: the moon will circle the planet, or the, you know, planet Earth. Is it because it wants to, or is it compelled to? So there's like some really, it's like, I don't really well, no, able to choose. no, that's right. But I guess what I, you're right. The planet couldn't choose, but you know, if we're physical beings, like the planet's a physical being, are we subject to the same type of laws of physics that the planets would be? I don't know. Okay. Well, this is the kind of stuff we're going to be talking about today. And then we're going to, you know, we can go off, you know, the plane a little bit. And we'll get, we'll touch a little bit into ethics. Because, you know, when I put this in there, you know, again, the way they like these courses constructed is that when we talk about the various aspects, you know, of knowledge and reality, they want to see, you know, a wide range of exposure of uh, philosophical ideas to you. So, you know, that's why, well, we'll do some Plato, we'll do some Augustine, and then we'll do some, you know, uh, Feminists, and then we'll go in to talk maybe Native American. We try to really mix it up. So it may seem disjointed a little bit at times because we're trying to force things into categories like that. And what I realized was that there was really no signal we talked about people's free will. Um, because you're going to maybe meet somebody someday. And I bet you'd like to think that you chose them. Um, but if you believe that you chose them, then you believe in free will. Um, so anyway, let's see what happens. Um, All right. So, if you believe that past events did not necessitate your future choices, and I guess we can include genetics and all that other stuff in there. If you believe that you chose it, you're a libertarian, all right? Um, in a libertarian in the sense of like that you believe in free agency or free will. That I've made choices for myself. I chose to whatever you have for breakfast this morning, you chose it. You know, um, whatever you're going to do this evening, if you're going to flip on the TV and you have a choice between two sitcoms, you're going to choose it. Um, you have a choice maybe where to sit in the class, per se. People usually sit where they always sit. You know, it's funny, in high school you hate assigned seating because you think that it limits your choice and then when you're allowed to sit where you want, everybody sits in the same place all the time. I know that even happens like in churches, right? It's like, 
and you go back to church, it's like, who's in my pew? Get out. I sit there. That kind of thing, right? So, you know, this isn't just being creatures of habit. That's what that is, right? We're creatures of habit. And that's okay, because we like order. You know, but what, how does that order play out then? Is the order ordering us around, or are we choosing the order things going to? So if you don't believe, per se, that you've had any real choice because the past events have pretty much put you in this place. Now, we're not talking about the limitation, right? I mean, there are certain things that could have happened with your GPA and other things in high school, you know, that made you eligible for particular schools and not eligible for others. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about, well, my own behavior has limited my, own, my decisions in the future. That's, that's the different story. We're talking about, did you choose any of those things? Um, and to be honest, you know, there's, there's no way to really nail this down. I think I shared with you before, and I, I should look it up, were those two... Um, monosogenic twins who were separated at birth in their 40s, both showed up <coughs> in the same city at the same um, uh, copyright you know, trademark place, copyright place, but the same idea, wearing almost identical clothing. Why is that? Um, some of you might favor your mother or your father and you might see it very evidently so there's got to be some genetic thing there, right? It's funny, one of my best friends growing up had a collar right up front. And I didn't see him for a good 20 years. When I saw him, I saw his kids. I didn't see that collar. You know? Are those things only for physical predispositions? I mean, are there other things that you can sense? I mean, is it odd that my wife goes into psychology and two of my daughters go off into that road and I go into philosophy and theology and from a little age, everybody said, that one's yours. So they always said, that one's yours. And she goes in and gets degrees in philosophy and theology. I mean, there's something else there, right? But yet, we're not ready to say that we don't have choices because that's not really a comfortable thought. I mean, we all just on conveyor belts going through the world and we don't quite know what's next, but nonetheless, it's already been determined. So hang in there, you know, which makes you wonder, you might be thinking, why am I going to try so hard if my future's already determined? Maybe that was already determined, then you wouldn't try so hard. I mean, it, you can get, there's a lot of philosophical puzzles here. So you see neuroscience goes into this, right? Um, philosophy goes into it. And once you start talking about this, you're, I don't care what, what you're in. You're in philosophical thought, right? You can be trying to figure out like, exactly what happens there, and the neuroscience will do that. But you know, you're still in philosophical thought at this point. So nonetheless, let's say, um, well, let me back it up here just one second. So let's say, and we're going to work through this scenario a little bit. A person receives a C on their assessment. And the reality is, is they were just too tired to study. So they just consciously said, I'm not going to study. Um, and let's even say that there was, you know, we tend to be very binary sometimes, right? Like that was their choice, to study or not to study. But the reality is, is that we're very complex beings. Right? And there could have been a lot of stuff that led to the person just saying, I'm too tired. Who knows? Maybe they had a huge meal for breakfast. Maybe they, they ate more than they normally did. So the friend said, hey, let's go out to a breakfast smorgasbord. And, oh, my God. After that, you're ready for a nap. Um, maybe they went out you know, to get in their car and they were going to drive to the library, but the car didn't start. And they're like, oh, I don't need this. And maybe the check engine light's been off for quite some time. And they even bother. Or maybe they're out of gas and they didn't bother sticking and checking. You know, and they went back in. Or who knows? Maybe, you know, if you were like my daughter and found out they were going to take the office off of Netflix, you got all upset, right? So you start binging it all at the end. It's like, you know what? I can study for the next test. <laughs> I got to get my fill of the office in you know, the next week because they're taking it off. Who knows? You know, now the thing of it is, is that. And we'll have to keep this in the back of our mind as we move through here, because I'm not sure if Frankfurt really addresses that as much. But we always think of a cause like, okay, you didn't get a good grade because you didn't study, you were, you were too tired. You know, we act like a boom, boom. Um, we've got to think a little wider in causes, and I want you to think in terms of, like, all the sufficient conditions that must be present for that to take case, right? So even somebody that may have, uh, let's just talk from a, you know, a medical standpoint, somebody might have a 
biological predisposition for who knows. Um, um, they might have insulin resistance. Uh, they might have uh, high cholesterol. Like my father, he had a, his whole family that had a cholesterol of like 500. I mean, it, this is, they were all from Poland. This is how it was. Um, so if you had a decent cholesterol, it was a little on the average range, a lot better than that, right? Now, you can't really eat poorly to get that kind of cholesterol. There's something else going on, okay? Um, so maybe somebody, though, is borderline, and they could control it a little bit with diet, but not entirely with diet, you know? Um, but nonetheless, you, you could at least, given the predisposition, still live a healthy life as provided that you're aware of it. People do this all the time with all kinds of conditions. But this is very important because you think of like, especially like, you know, I know most GPs aren't out to make us feel bad, but you go there and, you know, if you're trending towards something, you can't help but walk out of the thing and what did I do? My fault. You know, this type of thing. I remember when I was a kid, with, uh, you know, before like the acne products came out, right? If you're a young kid and you had acne, it's because you ate too much sugar. Now, we never had that in the house. We weren't even allowed to have soda. Unless you were sick, then you get ginger ale, right? But you didn't want to play sick because then you couldn't go outside, so you always felt good. You drug yourself outside, you know, if your limb was hanging on off the side because you didn't want to be stuck inside. But they would make you feel bad. Stop eating all this candy. It's like, well, I don't eat candy. We don't have any candy. You know, you're sneaking it somewhere. I am not, right? This type of thing. You know, and there was nothing you could do. So think of how many things, like even now, you know, that we have no idea what they come from, but, you know, a lot of diets are popular. And we put a lot on our hearts thinking that we have a control over these things. Do we? You know, you don't want to just say no because we're not going to dismiss, you know, the science out there. But we have to, in the back of our heads, think, who knows? I mean, I've, you can't even make this. I mean, I know this one girl. It's tragic. She was 31, died of lung cancer, never smoked a day in her life. Who would have thought of something like that, right? I have another friend who was a very heavy drinker, smoked for 40 years. When he worked in a car, um, well, he worked in a, a I guess it was a, like tile and carpet industry when he was in college. So when he was in college, all summer, he worked in this factory. You know what his job was? Now, this was back in the, in the 60s, so you couldn't imagine this today. His job was to cut bales of asbestos and shape them into the bin so they can go down to the conveyor belt. Think of that. So here the man's in his 70s. Not an issue. Smoked 40 years, cut his bestest bales up for three months over four, over four summers, drank like a fish for 40 years, and perfectly fine. I mean, that's a heck of a genetic lottery right there, right? I mean, that's pretty good. But, you know, so my point is, through all of this, is that we like to think that we have control over certain things, but then a lot of things we don't. Now, we're not talking here necessarily biological things, but I'm trying to use it analogously, right? Because there's a lot of things in our own world that, you know, in other words, we think that we have control over, and we're not necessarily sure, right? In other words, we, we may not be able to be aware of all the sufficient conditions that are behind it, but we still like to think that I chose this and I did not choose that. All right. Let's just leave that there a second. Now, the whole point of Frankfurt writing this was that it typically has been accepted that this principle of alternative possibilities... Um, is valid. So the way it said was that if if you have two choices and you could choose either one, then from a libertarian point of view, if you choose the one, you're responsible for that. Right? I mean, it just makes perfect sense. You can pick up the cake or you can pick up uh, the granola bar. Of course, granola bar has as much sugar as that. You can pick up that or you can pick up something else. You can go to the party, drink with your friends, or you can you know, go to the library and study. So as long as you have these two choices in front of you, you have an alternative possibility, then on a level of culpability, and that's guilt, right, you're going to be responsible for the effects of which one you chose. That seems right, doesn't it? Um, which kind of like leaves us in a pickle, sort of, right? We'll talk about that. Because if you're a libertarian, right, then you're responsible for the choices that you made. You can take the glory form, right? So you chose to come to Villanova, and you're going to study hard, and you're going to get a degree from a really fine institution. Way to go, you know. Um, you want to take credit for that, but you're also going to take credit for the lousy things you've done. I mean, that's just, you know, that's how it goes. So 
ethical culpability or guilt typically is, you know, connected to the level of freedom that we have. And you see this in our legal system, right? Um, there's less, maybe you'll get a less of a sentence if you um, cause death or harm out of, you know, anxiety and, you know, on a spur of the moment, as opposed to having being meditative thought beforehand, right? So they realize that, you know, the emotional state you're in mitigated some of your responsibility. In other words, you know, it lessened it a little bit. But you really only can only believe that if you believe that you actually have a choice. If you don't believe you have a choice, then we have a different issue. Determinism is not, I mean, this is where we're going to have a problem. So, how do I want to do this? Some of the people, let's call them the new atheists, they've acquired this name. They make the point that it's nearly impossible to have free will if you believe that we are biologic, simply biological beings. Because then we are going to be subject to the same rules and the same laws of biology and physics. So, we have a conundrum, though. Because when you and I make choices, they sure feel free. It doesn't feel like anybody held a gun to the back of my head and said, do that. So, what, you know, when I chose to you know, stop at a library on the way here this morning, to the class, I chose that. Nobody told me to go and do that. Nobody came and grabbed me and pushed me and said, you need to go there, or this is going to happen, right? So, you know, me and my wife, you know, it was her birthday on Saturday, so we went down to our bar, and we had a couple, you know, lemon shells and such. We chose to do that. We chose to celebrate. I don't want to think that, hey, we were forced to do this. You know, even in custom, somebody might say, well, it's a birthday, you feel it's a custom. Yeah, okay, that might have, like, been impressing on us, but... I still chose to do this. I could have said, hey, you know what, I'm going with my friends, this and that, you know, and been a jerk about the whole thing. And it wouldn't seem nice if I didn't choose it. So the same way with, you know, Christmas presents or whatever holiday you, you know, you celebrate this season. If somebody gives you something, you want to think that they have chosen to do that. Otherwise, what's the sense in all of this? You know, so we, we struggle with this because even from a determinist point of view, it feels like a free choice. We don't know what else to make of it. So you hear like some so-called the new atheist saying, it would be terrible to think you're going through life without really choosing these things. But you're not. You might like, you know, the color green or sage. Guess what? Some genetic predisposition that you're just unaware of how that thing is manifested to you. You know, you think you chose Villanova, but you really didn't. I mean, there were too many things that put the events in the, in the proper order, and, but that would be terrible. You know, they say, you, don't, you can't go through life like that. So just act like it's a free choice and leave it at that. This becomes a real position. But the other thing here is with determinism is, you know, how do we hold people guilty for stuff? Right? So, like, my friend is a psychologist. We were having a conversation the other day. He's putting out a new paper on sexuality, and... He said, what are you doing? I said, actually, I'm actually putting together a lecture for Frankfurt's compatibilism. I said, and it's interesting because he works with sexual deviancy and it has to do with, um, you know, sentencing and even, like, perhaps getting new paroles, like, you know, from prison. And why do we call these, if we, if we believe in true determinism, why do we call these things bad? You know, why are the people they went put in prison for something they could or could not have changed, Right. I remember I told you about that instance of a, um, a, a guy in his 60s has um, had a feel like tight inclinations that he never had in his whole life, and then they find out it was a tumor. They remove the tumor, and he has no inclinations again. A year or so later, they come back. Well, if he had been looking at child porn and got caught, of course he would have been punished and put into prison. Would that have made sense? It was a tumor causing it. He didn't have a lot of control over this. Um, if you work with anybody who has... Um, dementia or, or um, various strains of Alzheimer's and such, right? I mean, the personality can really change. Like uh, my wife, who works in a nursing home in the evening, you know, they, they tell them as workers, get it all out now. <laughs> Don't hold it in. Don't pretend not to swear and do all this because when you get older, the filter's gone and it just opens up like a floodgate. And all of a sudden, people are saying things it's like, you know, Grandma, you know, why are you saying that? Well, it was always there, but there was a gate of reason that was kind of restraining it. You know, so my point is that we don't 
call them bad or evil, or you know, who taught you to be like that? You know, in reality, if they can go back in time, they'd be absolutely ashamed that they said such a thing, but they didn't have control over it. So, I mean, this is not an issue that we can skate over, right? Now, there are variances on this. Again, I'm showing you libertarianism, and here it is, and showing you determinism, and here it is. There's variances on this, but what do you think about that? I mean, what? Because if you are a strict determinist, what do you do with morality? What do you think? Everybody thinking deep. Let me go a little farther, and I'll ask again. So, again, we talked a little bit about this last Friday, but the reductionist understanding, you know, if, if we're going to reduce our entire processes of the thought down to the biology, you know, if the brain is nothing more than something fixed and there's synapses firing, because, you know, where exactly is, if, you're, if you are a materialist, if you're an atheistic materialist, you're going to have a hard time accounting well, you can't account for the immaterial mind. The mind and the brain have to be the same thing. And if the brain's the same thing and you reduce everything down to the biological and physical laws that govern the world, then what makes us different than animals? I mean, maybe the animal really did choose to do that. That'd be kind of funny. One of the animals is like saying, you know what? Enjoy, clean it up, that kind of thing. Um, so maybe we just don't know these things, right? And isn't it kind of like where Hume said, you know, there's we don't really get the cause and effect where the connection is, but nonetheless, maybe it's out there somewhere and we just haven't discovered it yet. We don't know it. Well, maybe a determinist will think that. You, you know, there are these known and these unknown things. In other words, we can probably know something about our genetic predispositions if we go and take certain tests. And we don't know about our childhood because, you know, I've had, you know, I've had friends who talked about certain... Um, they would be the sexual inclinations that they had, and I don't mean oh, heterosexual, homosexual, I'm talking about other types of deviances. And, you know, as they started telling me about their childhood, it was all that you could do not to cry. And, you know, you'd think, well, if I went through that, I don't know how I would respond. You know, I mean, it, it's almost incredible that somebody can endure that. Um, that, how, that, you know, so those things, now they may be a known cause, but we don't know the effects of those causes in our psyche. We have no idea. How is that, how's that affecting our future choices? How's that going to affect um, a person's maybe decision to be intimate with anybody when they get older? It's difficult. Um, the same thing. So there could be these. In, so there could be internal things. We have no idea really the internal workings of our mind and our bodies, and even the external things that we can't identify. You know, somebody doing something that was drastic to you and, you know, horrific as a, at a young age. Yes, you can identify that external factor, but you can't identify how that affected you internally. So what do we do then with people who perhaps never would have killed somebody for money had they not started a drug addiction? And had they never started a drug addiction had they not been sexually abused when they were younger? You know, we, this is not like, you know, what do you want to say? Yes. Okay, which is making an interesting point. You often hear it said that a person who's an atheist cannot have a morality, right? Now, that's not the same as saying can a person who's an atheist be moral. But that's saying a person who's an atheist, where did they get their morality from? What do you think? How do you do it? Okay. Like some people have done it, right? Some philosophers. But how would, but how would you reason certain things? Like, um, why, okay, you're right. Why would murder be bad? Only according to reason. It's okay. So we, we, we form some social contract, right? But that doesn't really make murder wrong. Like yeah. Yeah, no, I, I got you on that. Yeah. You, but so he's saying, you know, in other words, you come up with some universal, which is what Kant tried to do, right? Um, how do I come up with an ethic 
that's not going to be based in some sort of religious things, and I'm pretty much going to say that I can't kill you because if I could, then I'd have to say everybody can kill everybody, and that's not going to work. But that's not really the same as saying it's evil, is it? It's not quite the same. The outcome is the same. Yeah. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at, though, is like, you know, we, if we called somebody who would kill somebody, you know, like if, um, where I used to teach, a girl came in, her friend, I, I know it sounds cliche, but it was true, he was killed for his sneakers that morning. You know, someone could say, what kind of human being does that? But, you know, even Kant would, he, he would say that's wrong. But he'd say it's wrong, you know, we get caught trying to say, like, why is it wrong, though? Maybe I'm not saying this correctly, you know, I'm not articulating it well. But we really come down to a matter of inconvenience, right? In other words, dude, I, I can't really kill you because that's really going to put your family in a boatload of emotional and financial strain. It's not the same, though, as saying it's bad, though. It, 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 we'd have to think more on this, but go ahead. Yeah, you'd almost have to have, like, a state imposing, you know, the, like a sentence in other words, to stop you from doing that, right? You'd almost would have to have that. Um, but you think of how visceral we are against, like, child abusers and people who murder the innocent and put them in prison. You know, if you are a strict determinist, you would almost have to think that you're, oh, look, the only reason they're there is because we can't control them. So we're going to have to protect them. We're going to protect ourselves from them. Here's where I'm going with it. it we're not going to debate this today. It gets difficult to, to, found, to put a foundation of morality. is isn't that philosophers who did it without religion. But there's a lot of philosophers who think that a lot of even that is what they would call residual morality from the Judeo-Christian, at least in the West. In other words, they realize there's something there, but we can't quite pin down how to not allow this. Um, anyway, you know, this is what it's all part of, though. Is it saying that death is pretty as well? Well, it could very well be, you know. I mean, if, if you're a determinist, you know, if, in other words, maybe they would say if they knew your genetic code perfectly and they knew the effects of the environment on that genetic code perfectly, even though we obviously don't, that they could predict your death to the day. You know, and say, well, here's how far it would go. Which means, you know, I mean, we all know stories about people who have lived totally haphazard lives healthily, and they're 80 years old, you know, smoking, this and that. And then we know people who. It's like, that kind of like, uh, that goes down to because a lot of people don't have the right to choose their Selection being played out. Yeah. I know what you mean. And then that's why like you can you get a huge generation of people that get to ninety. But now you see people dying at fifty and like, oh you're so young. It's not that it's just that probably in a hypothetical sense he would have probably died in childhood. In childhood. Well maybe versus his brother. Maybe could have lived out to ninety. Maybe, but I still think, I mean, there were people that lived in the 90s, but there was also a lot of people that died in the 50s, 40s, and 50s. Yeah. Especially in my neighborhood, all these guys eating sausage and everything for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's the truth, you know, they, they, they died in the 40s and 50s. But I get your point, which is an interesting ethical thing. <coughs> you know, maybe we're, we now have medical provisions that are allowing people who may not have been physically fit, who now are entering the gene pool, who otherwise would not have been entering the gene pool 
150 years ago because they may not have made it. But nonetheless, you know, it could even be, like your point on death, I mean, it could be that this is, you know, some of those things are predetermined. Um, we may just not know them perfectly. Okay, so a strict determinist would put that way. Now, here's, here's where we're going to come in now with Frankfurt, okay? Because if you say that you're only really responsible as long as there were alternatives possible to you, and if there's no alternatives possible to you, then you're not responsible. He's saying, first of all, Frankfurt is not a free will guy. He's a determinist. But he's a determinist that says, I still think you're responsible. And that's what, it, that's what compatibilism is. All right? So um, let me see what you think of it. In other words, now he does limit it here. He says, you're still responsible even if the choice has been already determined for you, but only if you have the internal ability to change. In other words, if somebody comes out, you know, if somebody comes in this room, grabs you, and hauls you out of here, you know, I couldn't, could you imagine if I said, well, you know, I'm marking you absent. <laughs> I'm sorry, you weren't present in class. And you'd be thinking, yeah, but they drug me out of here. Well... You know, okay, you'd make the argument that you weren't responsible, right? So he's kind of leaving that to the side. He's going to say, we're talking about internal causes, right? And again, you know, we have to talk in a higher, in a wider term about the sufficient conditions that are all here. But nonetheless, he says, provided that the choice is internal, all right, and it's not imposed on you, it's not somebody pushing you off the ledge, as long as that's in case, he says, you can still have everything predetermined but you're still responsible. And it's not just because he thinks that the whole idea, the principle of um, alternative possibilities is wrong, okay? And that's long been held as, hey, as long as you chose, you're responsible because you could have chosen something else. He's saying, no, it has nothing to do with whether you could have chosen something else. And here's how he tries to explain it, okay? Now, we'll use the names that he used. He used Jones, and we're not gonna go Jones 1, 2, 3, and 4. But he used Jones and he used Black. Okay, so I'm just going to use those names to be consistent with his writing. So let's say that a guy, Jones, um, has two choices um, in front of him, it appears to be, right? That Jones can study. In other words, I'm, you know, look, I can't hang out with you tonight, his roommate, Black, right? I can't hang out with you tonight. I'm going to study because I want to get a good grade on my assessment tomorrow. So leave me alone. That's one of his choices. The other choice is, you know what? A C's average. It's not like it's a bad thing. So I'm just going to hang out and have fun. And these are the two things he's going to choose. Now, at this point, it seems like he's got free will. What he doesn't know is that his roommate Black wants him just to lay around with him. Now, we're not going to like, you know, try to encapsulate all his motives. Who knows? Maybe he got a C and he wants his roommate to do his, you know, the same grade he has, or maybe he just, you know, is feeling kind of depressed and wants somebody to hang around with him, and maybe he's like, "Come on, you idiot! They're taking office off of Netflix. We can't be doing this crap today. You know, next week you can study. Who knows?" But Black wants him to lay around, so Black really wants him to choose B, but he hasn't said anything to him. All right. So remember, we're taking away the ex the external constraints. Black isn't just going to go and you know, and wrap them up in a bag and say, you can't go, that kind of thing. So, Black's thinking to himself, okay, I'm just going to watch and see how this thing plays out. If I notice, you know, that Jones is going to lay around, well, then he's going to do what I want. I don't need to do anything, right? It's almost like you will do other scenarios. I don't want to mix the scenario, but there's a lot of scenarios that we can play out in here. That's the first thing. But, Black thinks, I'm going to watch him, and if I see like he's going to not lay around me and he's going to go and study, I'm going to slip some allergy medicine in his, in his coffee or whatever so that he gets so drowsy, then he'll do what I want anyway. Okay. These are the two things. Now, the reality is, Jones just says, security test. I'm just going to lay around. It seems like Jones chose that freely. It seems like there were two possibilities there, but there really weren't two possibilities, were there? It didn't matter what Jones did. No matter what Jones would have done, 
that was the only outcome that was available to him. He just didn't know it. If Jones would have said, look, leave me alone, I need to study. Okay. Next thing you know, enjoy the drink, and he's like, ah, you know what, let's watch TV. It is. Well, okay, keep the argument. You know, I'm presenting you Frankfurt's argument. There's issues. <laughs> you know, there's issues. I think so anyway, okay. Now, he may come up with some, this is going back and forth. You know, they may come up with other things saying, you know, it's, it, it, there's other things internal. We, and, and I guess the reason why we're even trying to use like this scenario is because, who knows, maybe there's some genetic predisposition in him. You know, so let's pretend, but even that you might say, that's to be part of our problem. Isn't that still something external? But here's his point. So he at least can bring you this far. You know, he's saying the idea has been up to now that as long as there's alternative possibilities, you're responsible, you know, if you, if you are um, a libertarian and you're not responsible to be determinist. But he's making the point, I can show how you're responsible even if you are a determinist because did he not at least choose that? But he didn't have another possibility open to him. So he switches it around a little bit, and the way he tries to say is that ethical culpability is tied to you could not have chosen any other way. In other words, he's going to say here that Jones is not ethically culpable because he could not have chosen any other way. What looks like a free choice up there was really an illusion. And, and, and by the way, we're not going in this deep here, but strict reductionist, physicalist, and you usually are an atheist materialist, they will call free will an illusion. It just looks like you're choosing all the time. It feels like you're choosing all the time. But the cards are already been dealt. You just haven't, you just don't know them. And even if we can't, somebody might say, yeah, but you can't explain all of that. All right, so we can't explain it perfectly. We're kind of back where Hume was. Look, I realize that we don't always know the connection between the cause and the effect, but maybe we don't know it perfectly. We'll leave it at that. You know, Descartes said, "Hey, maybe we know exactly how the body and the soul are connected. Why my hand goes up when my mental capacities think it." But we still know, right? That's why Hume said we're pretty much just, you know, this is how things always go out. This is, it usually always happens, right? So we'll leave it at that. We'll put our faith in the fact that these typically are the outcomes. Well, here, you know, Frankfurt's going to say, it's, really, we don't know all these effects, but they're already predetermined. And unless, so ethical culpability has, he's, all he's trying to say is, that's wrong. Now, your argument's with, with standing. I mean, it could, that was an external factor. Um, if you try to go and, and if you just were typing in principle of alternative possibilities into a search engine, you would see, I don't know where the scenario came from, maybe Frankfurt brought it up, but everybody uses it. It talks about voting Democratic and Republican, right? Like, if a person's going to go and vote for let Lever A, as long as he's going to vote Lever A, nothing will happen. But see, somebody has put like a little microchip in the guy's head, and they're watching him the whole time, and he went and voted A, well, that's what they wanted. So we won't leave anything. But they seem to go vote Lever B, they send off the chip, you know, and then the guy goes over and because I'll do Lever A anyway. So the guy, it may have looked like he had a choice, but he never really did. You know? So there's a lot of criticism about all of this. But there's also a lot of things here that are decent for discussion. I mean, we have to admit that there are a lot of probably predispositions within us that we're not entirely aware of, we don't know well. And they really are choosing a lot of things for us that we may or not even know. You know, I mean, they usually, you know, like, if anybody did those, what do they call them in the high school when you, like, a vocational awareness thing, you might have filled out some sort of form to find out, like, maybe what is the best vocation for you. What do they, anybody do those? What do they call those? I can't remember. You know, they, they try to find, like, if they find out that you're, you're, you're a good listener and you're very empathetic um, and you tend to be very patient, and all of a sudden they're going to be talking to you about you know, sociology, your nursing programs, this and that, you know, and if you're, you know, so anal that everything, you know, you've got to have the, you know, everything has to be crossed the right way and you seem to be a little socially despondent, you're not entirely interested in, okay, well, you know, maybe, you know, accounting's for you, they'll kind of find something. So, you know, 
would we have found that way anyway? Like, I know for me, like, when I wanted to become an artist, right, there was no way. My dad said, you're not going to do that. All right, so he sends me to, a, you know, Gettysburg College, you got to go there, and I'm in this program at Duke where I'm going to go into biology and then forestry and then do this, and you know what? At one point, I just said I quit, and I went home, and he said, you got to go back to college, okay, but I'm going to do art. It's like, do we really wind up where we want anyway? I don't know. I mean, we may not always get there, but we may always be projected towards that way. So that kind of bothers us. It bothered me, but it should bother you that, you know, I mean, I'd like to think I chose my wife. But um, the terminus is going to say, well, you should feel that way. But it's not. It's just an illusion. The whole thing was all set up. And it wasn't by set up by somebody who was controlling it up there, right? This is why you'll see, like especially in free will, you'll see the introduction of a deity. Because a deity provides the way out. In the same way it provided the way out for Descartes. A deity is going to allow free will. Um, depending on the deity, of course. But nonetheless, it's, good, it's an element that's going to be there because, in other words, the person has that choice. Now, not all, even within Christianity, not all Christianity believes in free will. There are determinists even within there. Um, but that's a different story. So, you know, when we talk on Wednesday about social natures, um, you know, what we might today call constructs, and I'm, I'm not going to try to use that word too much because it's a different connotation but we can talk about in terms of our, our class. Like, you think of it, right? Like, did, did I talk here? It's like, I really forget when you said these things last, about the lady who invented um, the little things you put inside the crocs. Did I talk about it here? Okay, good. And this fits in here, too, right? Like, we have this illusion of, like, you know, we call it meritocracy, right? Like, being a self-made person. You know, we love people who, you know, have, like, made it. Like, if you ever want to talk to somebody who thinks education is a bunch of crap, they're going to say, hey, how many people? You know, they're millionaires. And they quit college and they named the same three. You know, it's like, okay, so the guy did Google, the guy that did, you know, Microsoft. You know, it's funny. Or Facebook, whatever. Um, it's like, you know, not the guy that's living above the bar down the street. We don't want to mention that guy, you know, this type of thing. So anyway, you know, my wife was flipping around one time at lunch and she saw, I don't, it sounds like an Oprah thing, and it could have been. I just don't know what show she was watching. But it, if it sounds sexist, I don't mean it. Talk about housewives who like made it, you know, made it big. And the one lady um, had invented those, are they called giblets, the things you put in the crocs and the holes? Okay. So she invented that, and she was on the, the show, and I really don't think it was Oprah. I can't think it was some, like, show where they showcase people who, you know, start up businesses and became millionaires. Anyway, she made a boatload of money. And my wife's like, why couldn't we have thought of stuff like that? You know, that woman's, you know. Okay, so I'm a natural born skeptic, right? I told you, somebody sends me a meme, I start researching the whole thing. I mean, did that person really say it? When did they say it, right? So somebody tells me that right off the bat, my antenna goes up, something's fishy about this, right? So I look it up. This woman was married to a venture capitalist. This man has already started and sold two or three you know, $80 million businesses. It's the guy's job. All he does is find products, develop in the businesses, build them up, and then sell them when they're multi-million dollars. This woman had an idea. Genuinely probably had an idea. There was somebody in place that knew where to get the money. I mean, if you, the average person is not going to know where to go and get you know, $500,000 for a startup, okay? He also knew the marketing. He also knew where this was all going to go. And he knew exactly how the whole thing should be constructed. I went and told my wife. I said, in reality, if that was you and you were married to me, you would have put these things in a Ziploc baggie with a ribbon on them and been selling them for $4 at the local craft bazaar. And that's about as far as this whole damn thing would have got, right? So all these things that seem like unbelievable things, we know that there's a lot of sufficient conditions that were behind it in order for them to make it, as is with you here, as is me sitting here, right? So the best that we can do is recognize these things, but nonetheless. We'll talk about that on Wednesday.